Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. When we became born again, we chose to run with God and to take a path with Him. And, you know, along the way, there are going to be things that happen. There are going to be life situations. There's going to be all kinds of obstacles, as, as you would uh, maybe call them, along the path. You know, has anybody ever been a runner? Yeah? Anybody? You know, I, I used to run in my young days. And I know when you run, you kind of have to keep your eyes on the path, right? Because if you don't, what happens? You trip. There you go. You trip. Or your foot lands wrong because there's a rock on the path or whatever. And so we've got to be watchful. I want to share some scriptures with, or a scripture with you this morning, several verses from Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. It's full of wisdom. Wisdom that applies to this life today. You know, sometimes people think the Old Testament's old. No, the Old Testament is there for us to glean from, to learn from. It is important for us walking in the New Testament. Amen? Proverbs 4, uh, verse 23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. You know, um, we sang, um, I think maybe that in that song, I got the message of consecration, of consecrating our lives, of, of making a decision that we're going to follow after God, and we're going to follow his plan for our lives, and we're going to follow what he has designed and determined that is godly, that is full of life, that is the right path. We're going to follow that. We're going to not let anything deter us from following his plans and his purposes. And we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. I love that old song, um, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his, I forgot the last word, glory and grace. Glory to God. Thank you for that help. We all help each other out. But so important that we guard our hearts so that we can keep on that path that he has designed. I encourage you this morning, guard your heart. Watch over your heart. For out of it flow the issues of life. Out of it, uh, it determines the life steps that we take. So protect your heart. Okay? Very important. And then, uh, this is r probably right along with this. I just want to say something this morning about our pastor. I know this isn't Pastor Appreciation Day, but I want to say something about him. And I've got the microphone right now, so I can. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> I just want to say, you know, he, he made a decision July the 11th, 1979. July the 11th, 1979. He made a decision to follow Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what's the truth. Nothing can deter him from that decision. He has been faithful to follow Jesus. Faithful, faithful, faithful. And more than that, I want to say today that when he is your pastor, you can be assured, I, I live with this man. He loves you. He cares for you. He prays for you. He fights for you. 
Hallelujah. He fights for you. He is a true pastor. Yes, amen. And I just want to tell you today that he is committed and he is following God's plan. And he is committed to be your pastor. He is committed to love you, care for you, instruct you, pray for you, show you the way to go, sh share, give you the word of God to preach the truth to you, to correct you with the word of God. He is faithful and he is committed. Hallelujah. I thank God that I have a husband and a pastor like him. Amen. 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 Praise you, Father. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that we can put our eyes on you. We can follow your plan. We can follow your purpose. And nothing, nothing can take us away from the path when we have committed our lives to you and decided that we will follow you. No turning back. No turning back. All the days of our lives, we will follow you and your plan. Father, I thank you that you are faithful, that when we commit our ways to you, you are faithful, faithful, Father, to help us, faithful to instruct us, faithful to give us pastors that love us, faithful, Father, to keep your word. Father, you are faithful when we speak your word that you are faithful to back it up, Father. Hallelujah. And I thank you for that today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Well, um, moving along now, we're, we're talking about uh, steps to obtaining victorious, a victorious life. <clears throat> and so we've we, we got about 10 things here we're going to talk about over these weeks or, or services. Started last week with step one was recognize the source of your problem. And the sub part of that was recognize the source of your answer. Who's the source of any problem? <clears throat> now, we, now, they understand this. When we say that Satan is the source of the problem, it can be directly or indirectly. That means if you go, you know, a cold comes on, you don't have to necessarily cast the devil out. Okay? I mean, Satan is ultimately the source of sickness, but it doesn't mean you got a devil on you. All right? If you do something boneheaded, you know, or something, you know, your finances are getting tight, it doesn't mean that you, know, you necessarily have a devil on something, it just made me, you made, if you made bad financial decisions, now Satan motivated you to make bad decisions. So Satan is ultimately the source, Amen. okay, all right, uh, of, of trouble. I uh, remember we talked about life, you know, if it kills, steals, and destroys, Satan is the author. <coughs> if it gives life, Jesus is the life giver. So the answer, the, the, the source of our answer is Jesus, God, hallelujah. Then last Sunday night we talked about be sure you have promises that cover the things you ask for. <clears throat> you cannot receive from God if you don't have Scripture to produce faith. Or I can say it this way, you don't have faith unless you've got Scripture to substantiate it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It doesn't come by, I hope so, maybe so, shoulda, coulda, wouldas. It comes by the Word of God. If you don't have the Word for it, you can't have faith for it. Now, you can have a Word from God that lines up with the written Word, and that will produce faith. We talked about this a number of times, how Dad Hagen talked about the man who was an old, old guy, and the Lord spoke to him and said, go drill your wells where I tell you to at a 45-degree angle. And every time he did it, he struck oil. Well, see, that, that went along with prosperity. God will prosper what you put your hand to, but he had a specific word from God. Now, some other guy tried and went bankrupt because well, God didn't tell him. And because God didn't tell him, he did not have faith. There was no faith to produce the result. Well, the Bible says, you know, he's not a respecter of persons. They say, that's manipulation. Yeah, God will, that's the end result, God's no respecter. The how, God can be. God can tell you to do it differently than he tells me. Now, the end result is we'll prosper. All right? But the how is necessarily going to be the same. He might tell you to go do this, and you prosper. He might tell me to go do it, and I prosper. Something else is different, and I prosper. But the end result is God's no respect of persons. He will speak to you and tell you how to prosper, but he's not going to tell you the exact same thing. All right? So don't try to use that. God's not a respecter of persons, you know. 
Uh, Brother Copeland tried that on the Lord. Go back and listen to some of his old tapes. He had read Brother Hagin's book, I Believe in Visions. And he said, well, Lord, I'm just going to start believing that you know, you're no respecter of persons. I'm just going to start believing that you'll appear to me like you did Brother Hagin. And he started confessing, you're going to, I believe that you're going to appear to me, hallelujah, and start confessing that. And the Lord spoke to him and says, yeah, I'll appear to you, all right, but it'll set you minutes, you're back five years, and you may never recover. Okay, Lord, you don't have to do it that way. Now, God, God Brother Hagin didn't, want, didn't ask the Lord to appear to him. He just did. You know, and if you've never read I Believe in Vision, you need to go get it and read it. It's a good book. You know, there's a lot of things in there that the Lord said to him. But you can't start believing God's going to appear to you. You know, and God leads you that way. Now, listen, he leads us by his spirit. The manifestation or the how he leads us by his spirit is up to him, not up to you. All right? <clears throat> so anyway, we talked about making, but so any, going back to this, you've got to have scripture for what you're believing God for. Somebody told Brother Hagin one time, I'm going to believe God, you know, I take care of my Ford Bronco. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the Bible says we can have what we say, and I declare that I have your Ford Bronco. Well, you don't have scripture for believing for somebody else's car. As a matter of fact, you probably have scriptures against that. You know, being jealous of your neighbors and being envious of your neighbor and that kind of stuff, you probably got scriptures that come against that. <clears throat> somebody say amen. amen. All right. And so um, last Sunday night, I don't think we got here. Did we get in to be sure you're not living in sin? Didn't think so. And if we did, you weren't here, so we're going to do it anyway. Because a bunch of you weren't here. It was Mother's Day, I know, I know, I know. We were here. I said we were here. Brother Bill was here. Schubert's were here. Who else was here? Carrie got here. Julie got here. Oh, cat was here. Let's, let's listen. Now, so we, we're talking about ways to have a victorious life. One, recognize the source of your problem, recognize the source of your answer. Number two, be sure you have promises from the Word of God that cover what you're believing God for. And number three, dun, 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 what everybody wants to hear about today, be sure you're not living in sin. Now, listen, folks, this is the only one you're not going to like, but you're going to have to hear it anyway. Out of all ten, the rest of them are really good. Okay, but you know what? You can't just leave this one out because it will affect your faith. Now, let me say this. Living in sin and having committed to sin are two different things. You may mess up. That's you committed to sin. But living or practicing sin and basically saying, I'm okay doing this, and I don't, you know, and, and I, I have no problem with it. As a matter of fact, I think I can do it. And, the, you know, the Bible tells you you shouldn't do it, and you're doing it anyway, and, and, and just living there and, and not dealing with it and not trying to overcome, you know, that's practicing sin. Amen. Okay? It'll hurt your faith. As a matter of fact, it will undermine your faith. Amen. How do you know? Well, if we look at 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> we can start by <clears throat> verse 19. Hereby know we that we are in the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. So what happens when you're in sin, living in sin? Now listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Everybody in here, you know, you probably in the past month did something that was a sinful and you just said, Lord, forgive me. You should have said, Lord, forgive me. Amen. The best thing in life to do is the minute you mess up, turn to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. I messed up. Yeah. Wash me with the blood. Clean. Just forgive me, Lord. Amen. And you know what? He's faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the faithfulness of God. Do not run out and say, well, you know, I just don't think there's anything wrong with that. Right. What are you trying to do? You're trying to justify what you did. And you can't. And now, God will forgive you, but he will not accept your justifying that it's right. Hello? Well, I just don't see anything wrong with what I did in the first place. Well, when the Bible says there's something wrong with it, there's something wrong with it. Hello? Well, you know, I'm under grace. It just doesn't matter. Well, we'll get to that. Besides that, we need to say hogwash, Tommy Rotten, bunk. The Bible is still the Bible. Amen. 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 Right. If our heart condemn us not, 
Then have we confidence toward God. Folks, if your heart condemns you, let me say this. You are a spirit. Your heart knows when you're done wrong. How many have ever done something wrong and immediately kind of felt yucky? That's not the point where you go, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. That's the point where you go, Lord, forgive me. Why? Because it's your heart telling you you did something wrong and you know it. Well, get rid of it. It's not that, it's not that difficult. God's not waiting to knock you in the left field. He's not waiting for you. Boy, when they mess up, I'm taking them. I mean, he's, I mean, he's Reggie Jackson. Yeah, how many ever watched Reggie Jackson hit? Let me say something. There's not a hitter in baseball who swung the bat like Reggie Jackson. Now, he's, he was from the, in the 70s. He played for the A's, and then he played for the Yankees, and uh, went to, Cal to the Angels, then went back and finished his career with the A's. But when Reggie swung, he was left-handed. But I am telling you, he looked like a corkscrew when he got done. He had, he, he had probably one, one of the, if not the longest home run ever in Major League Baseball. 1968 All-Star Game as a rookie. He hit the light towers on top of the old Tiger Stadium on the way up. In the out, outfield. The only reason he didn't go out of the park and go over 600 feet is he hit the light poles on top of the stadium. We're not talking about your high school poles that are 30 foot high. Okay. He, he, he did like this. He swung the bat, and by the time he come back around out of his swing, the ball had fallen to the ground. I'm telling you. Now, in graduate, his, his feet would be turned all like this, and he'd be corked all up. Then when he hit it, he hit it. And some people get the idea that God is just cocked up waiting, that if you mess up, he's going to drill you. Now, God says don't. But if you do and come to him with a repentant heart, he forgives you. Yeah. That is the grace of God. The grace of God is not it doesn't matter and it's okay to do it. The grace of God is if you do it and repent, he washes you and he cleanses you. And he treats it as if you never did it. That is the grace of God. Not keep doing it, it's okay. Amen. And so what happens is when we continue in sin, our heart will begin to condemn us, and we will not be able to approach God with a confident heart. And if you can't, listen to this. It says if, if, we, if, our, if we have confidence toward God, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him uh, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his forgiveness. And see, when you've, when, and here's, here's where we, we kind of mess things up. If you have sinned and you've asked God to forgive you, then God is not going to condemn you for it. You, if you go to God and say, hey, so-and-so did such and such, he'll go, what are you talking about? Yeah. Now, the devil will come to you and say, you did such and such. Nana, nana, boo, boo. You can't get anything. See, we got to get this thing right. Let's make sure our heart is not, not the devil. The devil's going to accuse you no matter what. He's looking for opportunity to accuse you. He wants to remind you of everything you ever did. Now, I, I grew up, you know, I grew up Pentecost, classical Pentecostal. And, you know, we always have testimony meeting. I mean, have you ever been to a testimony meeting? Now, sometimes it, it would go, if everybody just kind of wanted to get in on it, and, you know, and they would just kind of go, well, I want to thank the Lord that I've been saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Hallelujah. Yeah. But then somebody would get up every once in a while. And, oh, I'm telling you, I was, oh, I was such a sinner, and I did this, and I did You think, my God. At what point are you going to shut up and talk about what Jesus did? You know, when they get done, you know, oh, they just cry, and you think, and you find that it was 40 years ago that they did all that stuff. Well, you know, God forgot about it. You're under the blood. You're washed clean, glory to God. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Thank God that when you put it under the blood, it's gone. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Now, listen, you understand you know, some things, there's, there's consequences. Uh, uh, if you shot somebody and you've gone to jail for murder and you got saved and God forgave you, you're still in the natural, you're still serving the time. God's forgiving you and God's not condemning you, but there's, there's a consequence there. But God's not holding it against you. And in some cases, those people get out, God paroles them. I mean, Randy Greer, he didn't kill anybody, but he was, he was, a, um, he was a life, he was, he was committed to life in prison without parole. He, he, his, his paper said, day op available for parole, zero. You know? 
they eligible to get out of jail? Zero. He could never get out of jail because they considered him a three-strike criminal. Now he got saved, got turned on to the Lord, got a hold of Brother Hagin's books, started preaching in prison, also, and they, they paroled him. He's been paroled. And, and actually, um, what's the term? Not just pardoned. It was um, exonerated because he was a felon. He couldn't fly airplanes. He got exonerated. He, now he can fly airplanes. He flies his own plane to go preach. Well, God can do that, okay? But there, was, there were consequences in the natural, but that doesn't mean God's holding it against you. God's not angry with you. God's not mad at you. Amen? But if you're living in sin, you're doing this. when I say living in sin, how many have ever had to struggle with anything? Oh, and you just, you know, just, it's, like, it's been like a hound in your life, and it, just, it bites at you, and it hounds you, and you've, you've struggled, and you tried to get free, and you couldn't get free for some reason. Well, number one, you've you, you got Jesus, and you've got your pastor, and you've got the church family, and you could get help. But, but secondly, the, you're, 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 God, I did it again. I'm so sorry. God's forgiving. But the same person, another person doing the same thing and going, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You are practicing sin. You're practicing sin because you don't care because you think it's okay. Let me say, it's sin, it's sin, it's still sin. And if you're practicing it, your heart will be in a state of constant con con condemning of yourself. And you will not be able to receive from God by faith. Well, how do I get out of that? Repent! It's real simple. It's not a difficult process. Come before the Lord with a, with a, with a, with a humble heart and a contrite heart and say, Lord, forgive me because I have sinned against you. Remember the prodigal son woke up one day. He said he was eating the pig slop of the world. He said, even my father's servants eat better than this. What will I do? I'll arise and go to my father's house and say, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just let me be as one of the servants. And when the father saw him coming, you know, I'm telling you, when you have a repentant heart, God is, reaches out and puts the robe on your back, the ring on your hand, kills the fatted calf, and brings you into reconciliation by his mercy and grace. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. But he does not put up with condoning of sin. Big difference. Amen. Did y'all get that on TV? Who got that shot? Which camera angle had that one? Okay. All of them. Who zoomed in on my ties? At least it wasn't Pepsi. Or even a glass bottle of Dr. Pepper up here on the platform. Hallelujah. No, if, we're, if our heart condemns us not, we have confidence toward God. My brother and my sister, when, when, when you hear a sermon preached and there's message and there's scriptures in there that deals with what's going on in your life, and you say, that's sinful in my life. Don't listen to somebody say, oh, it's okay, God doesn't care. No, repent from it. Get it out of your life. Why? So you can have confidence toward God. So you can receive from God. So you can get answers from God. <laughs> the devil is trying to convince you to, to put a, a, a callus on your heart and cover it up so that you don't deal with stuff. Why? Because your heart will condemn you. You will not be able to have confidence with God. And you won't receive answers. And when you don't receive answers, you, it hurts your faith. And when your faith is hurt, you stop living by faith. And then you stop pleasing God. And then you start making up excuses. And what happens? You become useless. I know it's hard, but you become useless to the kingdom when you stop living by faith. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to tell you. What do you do? You get the thing right. You get your heart confident. You start asking from God. You start getting answers. You become useful because you're living by faith. Yes. God's not trying to get rid of you. He's trying to bring you in. Yes. But there are things we have to follow in principle. So if you're going to have a victorious life of faith, you cannot live in sin. Yes. Somebody say, yeah. And if you can't say that, oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Glory to God. All right. So first John 3, let's look over in Genesis chapter 3. How many knew what Adam was like? I mean, Adam was walking with God, talking with God. He'd come down. They'd walk in the cool of the day. I mean, they're having a pal session all the time. But then Adam listened to the devil. Ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God came down. Where's Adam? He's hiding. Verse 7, and the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam, his wife, and they hid themselves. You understand what happens? 
When, you, when, you, when you're living in sin, when the presence of God comes, you hide yourself. Now, here's how most people hide themselves. They stay out of church. Now, they'll blame the pastor. They'll blame something else. But the bottom line is they'll hide themselves from the presence of God. Because in that presence, they're exposed. Not that God's trying to expose them, but his holiness and his, the purity of his presence exposes us. The light of his glory shines on us and brings a revelation of where we stand. We stand, as it were, naked before him. Now, you can hide it from other people, but you can't hide it from him. Hello? You can put on the show for everybody else, but you can't put on the show for him. If it's there, it's there, and, you will be, and he don't even have to say anything. He says, where art thou? I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree wherever I commanded you not to eat? It's always a blame game. I said, when we get into condemnation, people don't want to deal with stuff, so they blame somebody else. Well, I'll tell you what. Now, can you imagine the audacity of telling God this? The woman you gave me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. He's been rebuked with the word. <laughs> so God looks at the woman. What have you done? The serpent began me. I did eat. Boy, they learn quick, don't they? Didn't take them but one, I mean, one session in the presence of God to start blaming somebody else for why they did what they did. You will not have a productive faith life doing that. When there's sin in your life and the presence of God brings a revealing of that sin, what do we do? We don't say I'm under grace or we don't blame Pastor Ed. We don't blame somebody else. We repent. It's not anybody else's fault. Hello? And you're not going to move forward until you accept responsibility and say forget. Now listen, here's the, here's the wonderful thing. The moment you accept responsibility and ask God to forgive you and to cleanse you, he does. He doesn't go, smack you idiot. I told you not to do it. Now Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. Why? Because of how he responded. He blamed God. It was God's fault that he ate the tree. How do you know? He said, the woman you gave me. If you hadn't given me that woman, this never would have happened. Except when he gave in the woman, he woke up and went, whoa, man. That's where the name woman came from. He went, whoa, man. Up until the time God got, he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar, he was excited that God gave him that woman. But now he's in trouble. It's your fault. You gave her to me. How many Christians do that? How many Christians get in a hard place and it's somebody else's fault they're in the hard place? How many Christians get into a place in, in their life where they're in sin or they're, they're living in sin or whatever, and, 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 when, and when something happens, it's somebody else's fault that they're there? No. When God's presence comes and you're exposed, what do we do? Father, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. And the grace of God that abounds, where sin abounds, it abounds much more, will come into play, and it will bring the grace and the forgiveness of God into that circumstance and situation and reestablish you once again in a place of righteousness with him, in a place of right standing with him. That where you will be declared once again justified, just as if I'd never sinned. 
before his throne. How great is the grace of God? It's not this squirrely stuff people are preaching. But I'm telling you, in the depths of your despair, in the depths of your trouble, in the depths of where you've messed it up and made a royal mess of everything, the grace of God comes when you repent. And the grace of God comes and brings God's forgiveness, brings God's restoration, brings God's glory and mercy into your life. And reestablishes you. And says, the past is the past. Let's go forward with the goodness and mercy of God. And watch what God can turn out of all this mess. Hallelujah. Amen. So if there is sin in your life, get rid of it. Say, get rid of it. Don't ever try to justify sin. You're just putting yourself on hold until you deal with it. Do you understand that you're not going anywhere until you deal with it? You're going to just sit right there until you deal with it. It's like having your car full of gas and somebody come and jack your car up and take the tires off. You can put it in gear and, sit and step on that all day long and turn that wheel. And you ain't going nowhere until you put the tires back on. And you ain't going nowhere until you deal with that. You're just going to sit right there. You can grab it. You can watch. Ming, ming. Boy, it's making some noise out there. Got the radio on, got the iPod playing, got the, the surround sound, the television up for the kids, and you're sitting right there. Get your life off hold. Get things straight with God so you can go on and live, out, live your life in faith, live a life of victory. Amen? Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 3. And then from there, we're going to Romans, the 6th chapter. Oh, glory. First Peter chapter three. That's right before Second Peter. Hallelujah. Starting verse ten. For he that will love life. How many want? Lo how many love life? How many want to see good days? So if usually, if you want to love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew. That means detest, hate. Resist evil, let him, I mean, and, let, and do good, and seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, his ears are open unto their prayers. Listen to this, but this is New Testament, folks. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And again, if you'll study some things in the Bible, you'll find out that, that, that overall, when God speaks of, of people who sin, uh, and, and, and things not going well with them, it is those who are practicing. Like I said, how many, how many, have, ever, how many have ever put a Band-Aid on you, on somebody? You know, put some Neosporin on them? You are not practicing medicine. Okay? Now, you did a medical treatment. You put the Neosporin antibiotic on it, and you put a Band-Aid on it, but you are not practicing medicine. That was a one-time event. Maybe you're in the wilderness and cut yourself and had to sit yourself up. You're not a doctor. Hello? If you missed it one time, you're not practicing sin. If you're living there, you're practicing it. So what do we do? We move forward. We, we, we eschew evil. We do good. Turn to the Romans, the sixth chapter. I know that, you know, well, this, is the, this is not usually the funnest stuff to talk about. But if we understand that the grace of God is available to us to help us, there's empowering grace, strength of grace, there's forgiving grace. Amen. There's just not condoning grace. There's no such thing. Amen. Grace does not condone. Grace, grace will strengthen you to quit. Grace will strengthen you to bring you out. Grace will, 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 will minister God's forgiveness. But grace doesn't condone. Romans, the sixth chapter. The whole thing. What? Oh, back up to Romans, the fifth chapter. Verse 20. For more of the law entered, but that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin is reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Another, you know, Paul with his rhetoric, his rhetorical statements. God forbid! Okay, there's the answer. What's, what's the answer to the question? We don't keep sinning because we're under grace. 
How, that's not complicated, is it? See, some of the read verse 21 of the previous verse. Woo, I'm under grace. Then Paul comes right back and says, now, are we going to keep sinning that grace can abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you're dead to it, how can you keep going back and living in it? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should do what? Walk in newness of life. The Apostle Paul says that the grace of God is there so that we can be dead to sin and then walk in newness of life. It did not say we can keep living in sin and it don't matter. Because what's going to happen when you sin? Your heart's going to condemn you. And what happens when your heart condemns you? You don't have confidence toward God. And what happens when you don't have confidence toward God? You won't be able to ask him and receive of him because your heart's condemning you. Remember 1 John 3, the ones we read first? If our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God? The, the reciprocal of that, or the antithesis of that is, that if, you, that if your heart does condemn you, you don't have confidence toward God. And you're not going to be able to receive. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now... If we be dead with Christ, I'm sorry, verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon. Now this does not say that we are actually there. We have to reckon it. We have to count it done. What? That's faith. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let me say this. You are not in a glorified, immortal, incorruptible body. So, therefore, you have to reckon it. Remember, Paul said in Romans, the 12th chapter, that he said, Offer your body a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable, or better translated, spiritual service. Amen. Paul said that he had to keep his body under. Amen. Are you here? Amen. Isn't that what it says? Um, the writer, one of the writers of the New Testament says this, to put off the old man and put on the new man. Here Paul says, reckon yourselves to be dead. In other words, it's a faith that, why? Because we had the spirit, we had the promise, we're going to get a glorified immortal body. If you weren't here Wednesday night, you should go back and listen to that. We talked about how you're not going to have the same body you got. When Jesus comes back, you're not getting what you got back. You're getting the glorified body. When your body dies and it turns dust to dust and ashes to ashes, you have sown the seed for a glorified body. You're not going to get the same body back. Woo! I said, hallelujah. Some of you are going to go, glory be to God. Amen? And I also believe, because aging was not what God intended, that we will all, our glorified bodies are going to be the perfect age. Hallelujah. I get to be 25 again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wait till I get in the gym then. Hallelujah. <laughs> Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to God, but alive unto God. I mean, <laughs> unto God. Reckon yourselves to be in, in dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 11. Let not. It did not say grace won't allow. It said let not. What does that mean? You are commanded to do something. In order to live above sin, you have to actively apply God's word to your life. You have to live according to the word. He has a grace called strengthening grace that empowers you. You still have to walk it out. He didn't say because you're dead to sin, you will never sin again. He said, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You have a responsibility. Why? What happens when sin begins to reign in your body? That you should obey the in and the lust thereof. <clears throat> when you do not deal with sin in your body, the lust of that sin will take control and you will be governed by those lusts. Hello? Come on, church. What do we do? We have to keep it under. We have to control it. We have to say, no! 
You don't go, well, you know, if I'm saved, God's just going to make sure I don't do that again. I remember one time somebody was down at the altar, and uh, <clears throat> this lady was praying, and Brother Hagin came there, and she was going, oh, Lord, take it from me. Lord, take it from me. Jesus, oh, Lord, take it from me. He stopped, sister, sister, shut up. <laughs> what do you want the Lord to say? That old back of habit. She dipped snuff. Now, how many of you, and I used to work at the back, and the, old, and the women at the barn were usually older women, and they all dip, uh, I think, mama rolls or something, snuff. Nasty. Go out there, have all that stuff running between the teeth, all brown, and you're coming down over here, you know? And they always had a nap because I mean, they're wiping that off all the time. And then, you know, little dog out here, I can park that out here, I guess. Spitting that stuff all over the place. And a woman like that, you stay away from because she'll cut you. <laughs> How do you know? Because we put a, a snake in, in, in the uh, tobacco on the top row one time and covered it with a leaf. And we heard this howl from out in the field from the tobacco barn. When we got back up to the barn, I mean, somebody was looking for all of us. They had their little hawk knife. They were ready to cut us. <laughs> we didn't put any more snakes in the tobacco after that. There was a dead snake. We killed it in the field. They didn't know it was dead when they, cut, they pulled that leaf off, though. I was young and really dumb. I ain't that dumb anymore. You don't mess with my dip snuff like that. Anyway, hallelujah. How did I get on dipping snuff? You and your members. There you go. Take it away, Lord. Take it away. He said, what's he wanted for? He don't dip snuff. The Lord's not going to take it from you. <coughs> He'll empower you to say no <clears throat> when you trust him. I said, when you put your trust in him, he'll empower you to say no to sin. So when sin comes, you say no. And then you trust God to empower you to walk that out. He's there. His power is greater than the desire to do the sin. But you've got to, you've got to act on that. You've got to, no! <clears throat> I will not give in to that. And I trust the greater one on the inside. I trust the grace of God in me to strengthen me. When I, as I say, no, I will not yield to that. Body, no. Now, my son doesn't typically overeat. But if I put Parker's barbecue, my, my version of Parker's barbecue, the slaw in front of him, he'll say yes. And just keep saying yes. And he'll be, he'll be sitting there with it going, I don't need that. <laughs> He'll swallow that. Say, <sighs> so, all right, son, yeah, I hit the wall, but. <laughs> and then he'll go lay down somewhere and go, ah, oh, 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 I shouldn't eat that. Now, he just, what did he do? He said yes. He didn't care. He knew the consequences of doing what he was going to do, and he just kept saying yes. He knew he was going to hurt for hours. But he still said yes. Now, the thing is, he could have said no. And it comes to sin, you can just say no. Not in your power. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Thank God there's a greater one on the inside. Somebody say, thank God there's a greater one. Hallelujah. So let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it and the lust thereof. Neither. Now, folks, Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He's not talking to unsaved people. This is not something he wrote to the Jews and not to the church. People come up with all kinds of crazy ways to say the Bible doesn't apply to us now because we're all under grace and it doesn't matter what we do. Paul says, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? God forbid. Now, Paul is establishing a positional truth and at the same time talking about a, an act of a vital truth or a, in, in the implementation of truth. Look at what he says in verse 16. Know you not that whom you yield your servants, yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to who obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But, thanks be, but God be thanked that you are servants of sin. You've obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which we delivered unto you. Being made free from sin, 
you became servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. In other words, Paul says, I'm using earthly examples for you because you're, you're weak. For as you've yielded your members of servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Well, then the opposite of that is when you're servants of righteousness, you're, you're, you're free from sin. But still your choice you have to make. I said, it's a choice you have to make. And in some things, it's going to be a choice every time you're confronted with it. You're going to have to make that choice to do the right thing. And you're going to have to say no. Amen. Y'all hear you going home. What fruit had, listen, what fruit had you in those things wherever you are now ashamed? Think of the sin, the things you had in your life that were sinful. What fruit was, was given out of them? If you're a womanizer, what fruit was in that? Hello? You can't go anywhere because you've got some woman in this town. They all want to call you daddy. That went over there. Listen to this. What fruit had you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is what? Death. But now, being made free from sin, you become the servants of God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting, right, uh, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, thank God. Now, we've already stated this at the very beginning when we start talking along these lines, that if you'll repent and ask God to forgive you, God forgives you. And listen, your end is not death. You put it under the blood, it's under the blood. I say, if it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Did y'all get that? If it's under the blood, it's under the blood, it's under the blood. Don't you go dragging it back out. No, you know, I repented of this five years ago, Lord, but I still fell bad. No, no, that's where you need to deal with that. Say, no, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. I've, God forgave me of all that I did. I've, I've put that under the blood. You know, now, if it's something you're doing right now, you're going to have to put it under the blood. Why? Because it purges your conscience. God's not trying to hurt you, but it purges your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Why? So your heart doesn't condemn you. Hallelujah. You don't need to be reminded what you did last year. God doesn't. The accuser of the brethren did. If you, if you came to church this morning and you sinned in the parking lot and, oh, God, forgive me, I shouldn't have done that. You know, maybe, maybe you, you cussed at your wife in the car. Now listen, I know a pastor, him and his wife, they drive to church and fight from the house to the church parking lot. Get out, go in, she play the piano, he'd preach, they have a Holy Ghost service, go back in, get in the car and pick up where they left off. How'd that work? I don't know, but it worked. They got, they got over it. They grew up. Hello? But you may have been out in the car and had a fight right there in the car. And on the way, he said, Lord, forgive me. You know what? He, when you get back in the car, he ain't going to say, now, now I, I'm mad at y'all for what y'all did before you came to church. He's forgiving. And this is where we need to understand about God. God says, don't do this. God says, this is sinful. This is wrong. I expect you to live a different lifestyle. I expect you to live holy. But if you miss the mark, if you, if you fail in those areas, and you say, Lord, forgive me, he cleanses you. And you can go on with confidence. So, the point here is don't live in sin. Ask God to forgive, but don't live in sin. Don't practice sin. Yeah. Don't go you have your men's fellowship where you drink, you know, the new, uh, uh, you know, on tap brew with a stogie and, smoke and, have, and have stogie parties and talk about how good the Lord is. Stuff's going on in some churches you just can't, you just can't even fathom what's going on under the guise of, of reaching the lost. The Bible says, be holy as I am holy. Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. It's amazing how many people are trying to, trying to be just like the world under the guise we're going to reach the lost. Did you know Jesus wasn't just like the world? 
As a matter of fact, he wore the rabbinical clothing and garb. And garb. They called him Rabboni. They called him teacher, rabbi. He looked like a rabbi. He didn't look like a, you know, whatever, whatever the sinners, sinners looked like in that day. He may have eaten with them. He may, he may have sat down with them. But he didn't change who he was. He, brought the, he just loved on them and brought the truth to them. But he didn't change him so he could fit in. We got these whole mantras. We got to fit in with the world to reach the world. No, you got to, you got to come with something the world needs. Amen. And you don't need to be smoking and drinking and all that kind of stuff so you can be like the world. We're going to win the world. Come on over to Faith and Victory Church. We got, we've imported illegally Cuban stogies. We're going to just have a, men, come on, get your free one for today. We're going to have draft beer and a stogie, and we're going to teach you about Jesus. Right. There's not going to be any faith there. You're playing a game. We don't play games. Amen. And if you're going to, if you're going to serve God, live in victory, you can't play games with God either. God didn't say for you to be perfect. God does, God does not demand that you never miss it. God does demand that you keep your heart right and pure, and when you do miss it, you come to him, to the throne of grace, and he'll cleanse you, and he'll wipe it, and you can go forward. I, I thank God for that, because I've missed it. I missed it this week. Well, yeah, I know. Anyway. What'd you do? I ain't gonna tell you what I did. I didn't cuss. I didn't run over anybody. I tried to run over a goose. But anyway, he's out in the road and wouldn't move. All right, buddy, hood on him at time. He got out of the way though. I was looking forward to it. I was gonna have me a hood on him. It's amazing. A goose will take on a tractor trailer. You are a dumb bird. How many seen them? I walk right out in the middle of the road and honk at you. Honk, honk, you know, ah, ah, ah. Driving a 6,000 pound vehicle, son. You, you, you will be RK. Roadkill. We had uh, one of the kids, had, had uh, our teacher in Westland, and uh, she, she ran over a goose one day or something. And, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You can't, do it. you can't have stuff. She wrote to the state and said, Look, she put them in the freezer. I'm a teacher. And I want to have this stuffed for educational purposes. And they gave her permission. So his name is R.K. Roadkill. <laughs> Bring R.K. to class. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's, let's stand up. Father, we, we, speak, we speak to this congregation. We thank you that as we make adjustments in our life and say, you know, uh, before I finish praying this out, if you love God, if you're serving God, if you're in the kingdom, you should want to live holy. And it should bother you that you've messed up. And, and it should bother you so much, the Bible says, godly sorrow worketh repentance. That you want to go before the Father and say, you know, I missed it. And the Father says, that's okay. I love you. Not that it's okay that you did it. It's okay that you've come to me and that I'm going to cleanse you. And I'm going to erase that out of your life. And now you can just stand before me as if you never did it. Husbands and wives, when your kids or, or, or parents, when your kids come to you and they've done something wrong, you can't slap them upside the head and say, what were you thinking? And they, they, they come repentant. You put your arms around and say, I love you, and, and it's, it's okay. We're going to help you. We're going to walk this out together. See you, see you come in, victor in victory over this in your life. God the Father does the same thing. Parents, don't teach your kids to think God's like you unless you're living like God. That was worth every parent coming this morning for. Give your children the same acceptance and forgiveness that the Father gives you when you've sinned. Teach them the love of the Father by how you respond. Amen? Lord, we bless this congregation. Per adventure, anyone here today that this message is spoken to their heart in a special way? And they say, oh, God, how I've, how I've missed it, how I've, I've missed walking the way I should have walked. But at the same time, you've reached out by your, by your loving hands and said, I am the God of forgiveness. 
May they experience the forgiving and restoring power of God. In Jesus' name. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.